Hello guys, Winston here. A long time ago, in a state far, far away, I started experimenting with Corian on my CNC. Corian is a mineral-infused acrylic polymer that comes in semi-translucent varieties that, aside from making good countertop surfaces, can be turned into a lithophane. Lithophanes have been on my radar for quite some time now, but I'd never had a reason to try and make one. When I was preparing for my cross-country road trip, though, and looking for cool but simple things to make as small tokens of appreciation to give to people along the way, lithophanes popped into my head. Conceptually, a lithophane is a really simple thing. It's a representation of an image that appears only when backlit. Thicker parts of the lithophane appear darker and thinner parts lighter. All you need to do is translate grayscale image into a height map. And yes, I am aware that you can make lithophanes on a 3D printer and do them in unique shapes like a lampshade, but for flat shapes, subtractive manufacturing is actually faster. And your end product will be flawless without having to fiddle around and dial in print settings to ensure perfectly uniform layers. For my grayscale image, I decided to start with something that spoke to my inner aerospace nerd, a rocket launch. Rocket launches work great because they are inherently high contrast events. Even in daylight, the exhaust gases from most rocket engines will saturate the sensors of all but the most deliberately underexposed cameras. After settling on a photo, I brought it into a photo editor and applied a black and white filter. But you can't just apply a dumb filter and expect great results. To really get good contrast, you'll want to adjust how different color channels are mapped to grayscale. To make the rocket stand out, for example, you might want to weaken the blue channel's contribution to the flattened image. This darkens the sky so that the rocket has a little more visual pop. Little tweaks like this will really improve your end result. Once we have an image, we need to create a toolpath from it. There are a bunch of ways you can do this, but the software tool I chose was MeshCam. MeshCam has a convenient import option for images that will turn it into a height map. All you need to do is tell it how large to scale the image. Since I'm working with a 5x7 inch sheet of quarter inch Corian, I told MeshCam my image was 5.1 by 7.1 inches. This way, I wouldn't have to worry too much about zeroing and alignment. The toolpath would just drape over my material. I also scaled the z-height so that the difference between the lightest white and the darkest black was 0.2 inches. This means the thinnest my Corian would ever get is 0.05 inches. In the machining prompt, I picked some conservative feed rates that assumed Corian would cut similarly to regular acrylic. In my first attempt, I threw a roughing operation on the whole thing with an 8th inch flat end mill and applied a parallel finish with a 1 16th inch ball end mill. The smaller your step over here, the finer your details are going to be. I went with 6th out, which is roughly 10% the diameter of my finishing end mill. This worked great for my first attempt, but I wondered if there was a way to streamline the process and eliminate a tool change. With a small step over of just a couple thou, I figured a 1 16th inch end mill might actually be able to handle directly cutting through 0.2 inches of Corian. I posted some new G-code without the roughing operation and a slightly smaller parallel step over. And when I first started the toolpath, I ran it at 50% feed rates, incrementally increasing the speed as I gained confidence in the process. This also worked quite well, although the Nomad was a lot happier climb cutting than conventional cutting. You can hear in the reverse direction pass that the cut just sounds so much worse than when climb cutting. As a result, I didn't hit the same feed rates as the attempt where I roughed out most of my material first. In situations like this, I'm thinking a tapered end mill might work better because you'll get a little more rigidity overall and better surface speed at the top of your cut. You'll have an easier time dealing with heavier axial engagement. But I tend to favor the two-phase machining strategy of roughing and finishing better than just using parallel all the way. As an acrylic-based polymer, heat will cause Corian to off-cast some fairly pungent fumes like with many other plastics. The combination of slower feeds and shallow radial engagement means you can't sequester heat into large chips. Roughing will let you keep your feed rates up throughout the process and the Corian cooler. And really, the time penalty of an added roughing pass is a small price to pay for much faster parallel passes, and that's where the majority of your time will be spent. In the end, I made a total of three lithophanes and gave two of them away. One's in Ohio, and one is in Colorado. And as is, they're pretty cool. You can leave them on a coffee table, or on a show booth table, as a talking point. 
However, since I had one left to myself, I figured I should come up with a way to display it more prominently. Since this is a rocket lithophane, I thought backlighting it with a flickering tea light would be a cool way to go. So I fired up Fusion 360 and modeled up a little base or pedestal for my lithophane. I didn't want to make a frame that went all the way around my piece that seemed a little too cumbersome. I wanted a minimal aesthetic. The Corian would fit in a thin slot and ideally be gripped somehow. Since the front of the lithophane is uneven, you need some extra features to prevent it from tilting forward or falling backwards. At first I was thinking springs or magnets so that I could easily swap a new lithophane in or out, but after playing with a couple ideas I came to the conclusion that it wasn't worth the effort. No one's going to want to hot swap lithophanes, and it's not like I even had another lithophane to show off. The extra complexity would be cool, but unnecessary. So toolless lithophane changing ceased to be a priority, I would use screws to hold my lithophane down. To adjust the screws, I'd make the base split into two halves, and to keep the exterior looking as minimalistic as possible, the base would close up with magnets. To ensure alignment with both halves and minimize the appearance of any seams, I would create a raised lip on one half that would interlock with the other side. The geometry here is a little more complex than necessary, but it worked out alright in the end. Now, most of you guys watching already know how to create a toolpath for this, pocket any flat parts, contour the walls, easy. I went a little overboard here though. I used 3D pocket roughing with 10,000 stock to leave on everything, then I did initial finishing on the walls, 2D pockets to finish the floors, and a spring pass on the walls again. The extra attention to detail and sometimes overly conservative cutting parameters was to ensure the part would come out pristine. There are some thin features in this design that could chip out easily, although a downcutting or compression bit would help if I was really that concerned. Also, at the end I did something a little different, I left an onion skin until the very last operation, and when I did cut through that, I left a few thou of radial stock to leave. This way, if the cutter grabbed some adhesive residue from my double-sided tape, it would hopefully keep it off my freshly cut walls. However, Winston from the future will tell you that a couple more thou of margin would have been better. Alright, now let's get to the machining. I loaded up an oversized piece of maple into the Nomad with double-sided tape and zeroed off on the bottom right corner. Odd placement, I know, but that's because my stock had to overhang on the left, otherwise it would cover the tool probe. I started my first program and almost immediately realized that I forgot to make a critical adjustment. My lithophane blank was purchased as a 5 by 7 inch rectangle, but when I actually measured it, the width turned out to be 5.035 inches, so I tweaked my slot to be 5.04 inches wide and reposted. All right. Now we can cruise through the time lapse. For the most part, this part cut like a dream, but there were places where I felt like my parameters needed adjustment, so I made the changes in the G code for the second half. Some parts during roughing, I wanted shallower step downs or faster feed rates. On my finishing contours, I decided to go with deeper step downs and slower feeds. In my second program, I screwed up the order of two of my toolpaths. I pocketed the floors before I'd done my initial finishing contours, so the end mill ran into the radial stock to leave on the outer edges of my pockets. Luckily, it didn't seem to negatively impact the surface finish too much. With climb cutting, any chatter or tool deflection pushes the cutter away from the wall, so your parts can sometimes be salvaged when you run that final contour operation. Other than that mishap, on the second part, things went pretty smoothly. I pulled my base halves off the table and cleaned off a small amount of adhesive residue with goof off. I also touched up the edges with some fine grit sandpaper to remove some fuzz, but the wall finish you see is straight off the machine. These portions are completely untouched. When I got home, I added the screws and magnets and the piece was finished. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how the machining portions of this project went and also with the look of the finished package. The LED candles look decent on camera, but in real life they're a little too dim for this application. They also have a really strong orange cast that I'm not entirely happy with. There's also a visible gap between the wood and the corian in places, but that's almost impossible to avoid unless you somehow factor that in when making your lithophane. But that's really a minor gripe that doesn't detract from my enjoyment of this project as a whole. If I were to do this again though, I would change a couple things. One, I would cut the lithophane thinner. The 0.05 inch minimum thickness is fine for indoor use if you hold it up against a standard bulb for illumination, 
but if you want to use this in a darker room or in more subtle applications, I would go thinner, maybe 30 or even 20 thou thick. Two, there are pockets in my design that were entirely unnecessary. That costs extra machining time and reduces weight. With a base like this, lightness isn't a benefit. I actually consider doing what Beats Headphones does and throw literal trash inside to make it heavier. Three, unless you're going to tap this hole or use a threaded insert, this area right here is a weak point and the act of driving a screw can cause this part to chip out. So either blow open this part of the wall from the start or pick a finer thread screw. Number four, this base would look awesome if I started from bookmashed pieces of wood, but because of the way I cut the interlocking lip, this design wouldn't actually be able to have the grain line up perfectly when assembling. If I switched this design to use interlocking pins, this interface would then be able to match up seamlessly. It would also actually simplify the machining. And lastly, number five, if I had any inclination to do electronics work, I'd probably make a diffused LED array to put behind this lithophane so I could not only dial in the exact brightness and color temperature I want, but also isolate the flicker to just the rocket exhaust area. But minor quibbles aside, I think this form factor for displaying a lithophane is awesome, and I wouldn't mind revisiting this project in the future to incorporate some of the improvements previously mentioned. I want to thank you guys all very much for watching. Don't forget to check out the Carbide 3D channel where I'll be distilling a lot of the information I've learned through projects like this in shorter informational videos, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.